Well, COVID-19 infections are on the rise, but there's been no surge in hospitalizations. A recent Sisonke study has found that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine prevents 82% of admissions, but a study in the JAMA Medical Journal found Pfizer vaccines have rapidly decreasing efficacy. This is all very confusing, so let's get some clarity from leading epidemiologist, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Of course, people will naturally be concerned when we see articles of studies showing that the Pfizer vaccine is not as effective against the Omicron variant. Uh, what's your take on this? Sorry. Good evening, Sean. Good evening to all the viewers. <clears throat> what we know when we uh, vaccinate individuals is that the antibodies that are generated, they will wane over a period of between six and 12 months. And we see that pretty much for all vaccines, that the efficacy in preventing mild infections declines. However, when, it, when we look at efficacy in preventing hospitalization, and preventing severe disease, that is consistent and remains at a high level throughout. So when we hear that a study is producing a, a finding that the efficacy is waning, that is something we are aware of, but it only refers to mild infections and not severe infections and hospitalization. Okay. And this is a Danish study of 128 people who had received two to three doses of um, the Pfizer vaccine. So ultimately, do you think we're going to have to be taking more booster shots going forward? And if you can, perhaps give us a time frame here, because, you know, is it going to be an annual thing every six months or so? So at the present time, there are several studies that have looked at the, the long-term strength and protection that we get from uh, vaccines, both mRNA and viral vector vaccines. And what they have shown is that immunity wanes over time and the efficacy against mild infections does decline. Now, why is it that that's occurring? We don't fully understand because that occurs even with natural infection. When you get natural COVID-19, it also declines. But when we look at the vaccines, they still work against all of the different variants, even though it was made against the original Wuhan ancestral strain. So what is going to be the next step? Well, the, the current strategy that's being used in places like Israel, for example, is just to keep giving repeated doses. They're giving the fourth dose, uh, may even go to giving fifth doses. But that's not really a strategy and not really uh, a solution to the problem. Instead, there are at least seven groups that I am aware of that are working on a new vaccine, a second generation vaccine. And what that vaccine does very cleverly, it looks at what parts of the virus are conserved across the different variants. Because if those parts are conserved, it means the virus can't change them very easily without it creating a problem for the virus. So that means future variants also won't be able to change those parts. And so that's called a conserved epitope-focused vaccine. So it's, it's basically a vaccine that is going to target the parts of the virus that it can't change. And so we expect it to be efficacious even against future variants. So that's what's coming in store. How long will it take? Well, I'm pretty optimistic. Two of them are already in clinical trials. Perhaps early in the new year, we should be seeing these kinds of new uh, generation vaccines. Are we going to become a world of vaccinations going forward because of COVID-19? Because, you know, we can't even get more than half of our current population fully vaccinated which uh, basically puts us in trouble as a nation. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really is a problem. I mean, currently, when you look at the situation in North Korea, I mean, they have a rampant epidemic with a highly infectious Omicron strain. Uh, you know, and there's almost nothing you can do if you don't have a vaccinated population. In fact, China is in a similar situation. 
they have pretty low levels of vaccination coverage, principally because they had a zero COVID policy, so people didn't feel COVID was a real problem. And so we're seeing the, the hazards of having a population that is unprotected. So that means, you know, the way in which we're going to protect ourselves is using vaccines. And we've used it effectively in getting rid of, for example, one of the world's you know, biggest challenges in a disease called polio, which many young people don't even know about. It used to cause paralysis and was a deadly disease. We have eliminated polio from the world mm. using vaccines. So vaccines are going to be an important part of the future. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about the current infection rate we're seeing in South Africa. Many people are questioning why we're not saying that we are experiencing a fifth wave, etc. But it's key, obviously, to look at the hospitalizations as well in terms of how concerned we should be. Because the World Health Organization did say last week that they were concerned about the number of infections in South Africa. I think we've, you know, there are many different criteria you can use to determine whether you're in a wave or not. You can look at it as a fraction of the past waves, or you can just look at it as an absolute measure or the positivity rate. In our case, at this point, our seven-day moving average is just over 7,500 cases per day. So no matter what criterion you use, we are in the fifth wave. Yeah. Whether it's called or not, it doesn't matter who we are in a fifth wave. And that means that we are likely to see increasing cases. But because of the nature of this particular variant, because it's a sub-variant, BA4 and BA5, of the original Omicron, BA1 and BA2, we would expect that there would be some level of immunity from the past infections that would protect us. And we would also expect that those who have past infection and vaccinated will also have protection in addition to those who are vaccinated. So as a result, we are not seeing a large number of hospital admissions. Hospital admissions have only gone up quite slightly, but the cases have. So I think that's the scenario we are seeing. The worry is that we can't become complacent and we have to follow what is good science and the good science is at this point is that we should follow what is called a vaccination plus strategy so use vaccines as your your foundation of your overall strategy and you build on that a few public health measures to try and reduce and mitigate the spread of the virus mm. and those public health measures are simple things like wearing masks in indoor settings. And in fact, many countries have instituted measures like that. Some countries have chosen to go the route of, you know, the virus doesn't exist. And we see that in the UK, for example, with over 100,000 cases per day, over 1,000 deaths per day, no public health measures at all. They're banking purely on vaccination. That's not a very wise strategy, but that's the way they've chosen to go. I think we've chosen a slightly more sensible approach in the sense of using both vaccination because we have lower vaccination coverage and some of our public health strategies. Yeah, and, and I want to talk a bit more about the measures in place because governments come under much criticism for some of those measures. Uh, many people are saying that they're trying to control the way society lives for years and years and years beyond uh, what they should be. Do you think that government has made the right moves in terms of the current regulations we have to deal with the spread of the virus? I think if we're going to um, uh, institute public health measures, we're really trying to do two things. The first is we're trying to avoid a situation where with the emergence of a new variant that the virus would spread very rapidly. In other words, we would have super spreading events. We have to try and avoid that kind of situation. So that means essentially that we have to do two things. We have to try and prevent large indoor gatherings unless everybody is vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so that strategy is an appropriate one because if you have, for example, as we did in the Belito Rage, 
in a matter of a week, you go from a handful of cases to thousands of cases. And that puts us in a situation where the virus just gets very quickly out of control. And so it makes sense to do that. The second is to uh, institute indoor mask wearing. And that's a good strategy just because of the risks the indoor setting has in that ventilation is a big issue. And in the presence of a situation of being indoors, masks are, are very helpful in terms of protecting people. So if you just take those two measures, that pretty much provides you with much of what you need in terms of preventing an out-of-control epidemic from occurring. So I think to the extent that the regulations, I haven't you know, looked at it in any great detail, but mm. from what I've seen, I think they cover at least those two things. Okay, thank you so much for your insight. Always a pleasure talking to you, epidemiologist Salim Abdul Karim.